Good morning, church. Welcome. We appreciate your patience this morning and invite you to stand. Um, we are always just so excited to praise the God of the universe. This morning, we had the opportunity to, uh, to have a short devotion even before anybody came in and, uh, as, a, as a band and, um, and to just be reminded of how big God is and how good God is and how steadfast the love of our God is. And, and, and as Christians, we have, we have committed to praising Him with all of our lives. So let's recommit that this morning.
Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to have everybody this morning. And uh, go ahead and have a seat. We're so glad you're here. I wanted to announce something that's brand new that we're starting actually today. You get to be a part of it. How exciting is that? We are starting a missions team at uh, a community here, and, and we are really excited about it. Um, the timing on it could not be better because we're going to be talking about that this morning, actually, as we go through the story of Jesus and how that relates. But I don't know if you're aware, most of you should be aware, we support missionaries at our church. In fact, we have uh, multiple families from our church who are actually uh, living you know, away in, in other countries and are sharing Christ in other countries. And um, we've just not done a good job of supporting them, and, and that's going to change. That's going to change starting today. Um, the goal of the missions team is to support our missionaries. Just to put it simply, it's just to support our missionaries. We are going to pray for them, and if you're part of the missions team, all you, you know, you're going to receive their updates. You're going to receive, they send periodic letters. Uh, we're going to have prayer requests that you'll be getting periodically, probably about once a week things to specifically pray for that are going on in their lives. Katie Warmoth is going to be in charge of the missions team, and she's done a lot of work putting this all together and connecting with the missionaries. Our goal is, is for them, when they're, when they're serving Jesus away from home, let them know that they're not forgotten. And let them know that, that we, we love them and we appreciate what they're doing and we want to, we want to support them. And so we're going to be you know, writing letters. We're going to be Hopefully having some times where maybe they can send videos talking about what they have going on or maybe FaceTiming in. But we are going to become more passionate about missions. And I'm super excited about that. So I know you're all wondering right now, how can I be a part of this amazing team, right? It's super easy. Um, we are using, you can, you can, first of all, you can tell me. That's fine. And I'll make sure that you get added. Or Katie Warmoth, you can let her know as well. But the easiest way to do it is to, is to get out your weekly update. So if you have not subscribed to the weekly update, it's a super easy thing to do. You could do it right now. All you need to do is get your phone out and text, like you're going to send a text message. Text to the phone number 97000. Text to the phone number 97000. And then in the message, just put weekly update, all one word, weekly update. When you do that, each Sunday morning at around 9.30, you're just going to get a text, and it's just going to have a link, and you click on that link, and you'll get an update that's going to tell you things that are going on. And in this week's update, one of the things that's in there is talking about the missions team, and there's a, there's a button that says click here to join now. If you click there, you will automatically be subscribed to the missions team. If you say, Pastor Doug, I'm just not a tech person. That's okay. Call me, text me, call Katie Wormuth, text Katie Wormuth, uh, and we will get you added. But we are really excited about that. I want to make sure that you are part of that as well. Again, this is probably going to be a weekly email that you would receive. And then uh, periodically in church, we're going to be highlighting different missionaries and, and countries uh, where, where we have, uh, where people are, are hearing about Jesus. All right? So let's pray together this morning, and we're so excited to be together. Most Holy God, I want to thank you so much for your, your love and your grace in our lives. I want to thank you for your goodness. I want to thank you for all that you are. Lord, we just want to pray for our missionaries right now who are just all over. And God, I'm just excited to be able to just begin to lift them up more uh, by name and just begin to, to lift up their specific needs. And I pray that you would bless them and encourage them even now. Lord, I just am so thankful for those who are joining us online and for those who are joining us here in person. And I just pray that this would be a time that we would just really just forget about everything else that's going on in our lives and really just focus on you. Because as we do that, God, it just changes everything. As we draw closer to you, it just reminds us that you're God, that there's nothing too hard for you, that, that you have a plan, you have a purpose. And God, we just want to worship you today because you deserve it. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing one more song.
you to be seated. We're really excited about this series, and uh, I've just so much enjoyed it. You don't get much more pure gospel than just going through the gospel according to Mark. And uh, it's exciting to see the story of Jesus and, and, and just follow it through all the way, just looking at every verse as we kind of go through and getting a good picture of what, of what this is all about. I love coming to church. I, I, just, I do. I love it. And the more I learn about God, the more my life comes into focus. And I learn about God's love for us, and you know we learn that God has a plan, and, and it's comforting. We're reminded that God is in control. And uh, but this morning we're going to be challenged to look a little beyond ourselves. You know we come to church and it does all of these amazing things for us, but but this morning we're going to be challenged to look a little beyond ourselves, and we're going to look at a story that's very familiar to you. You've probably heard this story. And maybe had some questions about it or some thoughts about it. Uh, but we're going to see that there's maybe a little more of the story than what you may have originally thought or heard. Mark chapter 11. I'd like to invite you to join me as we read together. It says, Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So what's happening here? Last week, we picked up where, where Jesus was making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the crowds lie in the street, and they're crying out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and, and blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So, so he moves from there, and he's going to go to Jerusalem. So let's just continue. Verse 11. And Jesus went into Jerusalem, into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things... As the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And the disciples heard it. So they came into Jerusalem... Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. So what's happening here is, is we kind of pick up in this story. He goes from the triumphal entry, and he goes to the temple in Jerusalem, but it's, but it's kind of late. He goes and he looks around. But he comes back the next morning, and we're gonna, we'll talk about the prayer and the fig tree. We're going to talk about that actually next week. We're going to focus this morning on this time that he's, that he's at the temple. So he goes back to the temple the next day, and man, this isn't Jesus the way most people don't think about Jesus. This is a Jesus who goes in and starts tossing temple tables. I mean, I thought about getting crazy this morning and setting up a table up here and putting stuff on it, and you're just kicking it over, and I thought, no, that might, that might be too much, <laughs> you know? But, but I thought, you know, we just don't, we, we read this and we kind of gloss over it. We don't see the, the violence. We don't see the... The fury, we don't see the passion that's taking place whenever he does this. It's crazy to look at. He doesn't allow people to carry their wares to the temple. He makes a scourge. He begins to drive people out of this temple area. The people and, and, and the animals and, and all these things are going on. And the religious leaders are infuriated. What's going on? Well, the first thing we see and we understand is that Jesus was angry. All right, so I'm going to stop for a minute. Is, is it okay to have church if the computer doesn't work? <laughs> we, <laughs> we were talking about beforehand, and we kind of said, yeah, maybe we should probably go ahead. But uh, we're going to go ahead. <laughs> so just follow with me. So Jesus was angry. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? We, we sometimes think about 
anger as being something wrong or anger as being something that's, that's sinful. Um, but Ephesians 4, 426 says this. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You can be angry and not sin. And of course that makes sense because Jesus was obviously angry. We know that Jesus had no sin. So why was he so angry? Well, it's because Jesus is passionate Jesus is passionate about this thing that he's doing. He came to die on the cross for our sins. He came to make it possible for us to be restored in our relationship with God. And he is passionate about that. And and, and we are created in his image. And so so if you're passionate, we're created to care. And if you care, you're going to have feelings. And we saw very clearly that Jesus does care. You know, if you care, you're going to experience feelings of love. If you care, you may experience feelings of jealousy. If you care about somebody and you see them, you know, flirting with somebody else, or, you know, you, you're going to have those feelings. Um, if, you're, if you care, you, you may have feelings of anger. You see, God gets angry when, when there's a violation of his character. God gets angry when there's a violation of his character. So let's look at some instances, just a few. There are a lot of them in the New Testament, in the life of Christ. Let's just look at a few times where where Jesus got angry. In Mark chapter 3, we looked at this at the beginning of our study. It says, Then Jesus said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, So this guy comes, and he needs to be healed, and Jesus looks around and says, is is it good to do good on the Sabbath? And as you read the context of what's going on, the religious leaders, they don't care about this guy. They just, they don't care. They're just angry that Jesus is breaking their rules. The rules, by the way, that Jesus wrote, you know, he knows the rules. And he got angry because he cared about this man, and they didn't care. It violated his character. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. God gets angry when people know the truth and they suppress it. When they know what they're supposed to do and they don't do it. Or when they know what the truth is and they don't share it. John chapter 2. We see... That Jesus cleansing the temple. You know, Jesus did that twice. He does it at the beginning of his ministry. He does it at the end of his ministry. Let's read about what happens at the beginning in John chapter 2. When the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturn the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. He gets angry. Why is he getting angry? We're going to see in just a moment. Let's look at right now what we just read in Mark chapter 11. Jesus cleanses the temple again at the end of his ministry. Remember, this is a week before he's going to be crucified. So, so they came to Jerusalem Jesus goes into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned uh, the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for what? What's it say? For, For all nations. There is a purpose for his anger. Why is he so angry? He's angry because um, there's a whole group of people who aren't able to worship because of this circus that's taking place in the temple. There was, there was a purpose to his anger. When we think about anger, sometimes human anger, James chapter 1 says, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. But there is an anger that does produce God's righteousness. This isn't a picture of God just losing it. This isn't a picture of Jesus going in and he has this flash of anger and he just loses, starts throwing things and and throwing a temper tantrum. That is not what's going on. This was intentional. 
In fact, remember how we started off? In Mark chapter 11, triumphal entry, he goes to Jerusalem, he goes into the temple, and in Mark 11, 11, it says, and Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all these things, the hour was already late. Jesus had gone there in the night before. And he goes there the night before, and he looks around, and he says, these people still don't get it. He starts his ministry off by saying, this is not acceptable. This is not appropriate. And as he winds down his ministry, a week before he's crucified, he walks back in again. And he says, this is not acceptable. So he gets up this next morning, and he goes to the temple, and he takes care of business. <laughs> he takes care of business Jesus style, you know. We don't often think about that. But Jesus was passionate about these things. You see, he, it wasn't a flash temper. Psalm 103.8 says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in mercy. There's a purpose and a reason for his anger. You can kind of think about this if you have kids, or if you've ever, you know, if you remember the way you, when you were growing up, uh, how you were raised. There are times as a parent where you get angry, and there are times you get angry in not the right kind of way. <laughs> you know what I mean? There could be times where you get angry, and your discipline is not constructive. In fact, if you're angry in the wrong way, it could be destructive. You say things that you wish you could take back. You maybe go too far in, in the punishment that is given. You, you do these things, and it actually tears the, the child down as opposed to helping them. As you go through and you think about that, Ephesians 6.4 says this. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. He, so, so he's saying that whenever, you, whenever we deal with our kids, there's this fine line between... There are things that, that should make us angry, and there are things that our kids should see us, times where they should maybe see us angry, but it's not an out-of-control anger. It's a purposeful anger that has a purpose in, that, in the child's life. And, and if you think about that, that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He's not, he's not lost it. He's, he's coming in, and he's saying, these people need to understand. This is not acceptable. And nothing about me is ever going to tell them that it's acceptable. So he goes in, and it's a controlled anger that, a, that accomplishes a purpose. You see, Jesus is passionate about people from every nation having an opportunity to worship him. He's passionate about it. In order to understand why he's so upset, let's, let's take a look at the temple. Right? So I, I found this uh, on the internet, and this is, this is kind of a, a, a what the temple would have looked like. So if, if, you look, if you look at this diagram, you'll see you have these walls. Then you have this courtyard kind of where this open area, you see that courtyard that's where the circle, red circles are there. And then in the middle of it, you have the, the area where the Jews would worship. The, it's walled in again, and then you have the area where the Jews would worship. And then if you go on even further, there's the Holy of Holies where, where the priests would go on and offer sacrifices, you know, and, and just that, that no special place, right? So the Jews would worship in that, that center section that's walled in. But the Gentiles' courtyard, that was where, if you were not a Jew, that was where you went to worship. And, and, and what happened here is, is they turned this into like a flea market. This open area, which was the only place that Gentiles could go, a Gentile is anybody who is not a Jew, this is where they went to worship God. And what happened is, as travelers would come, and they would come from great distances to come to the temple to worship, and they would come you know, for, for Passover, they would come like, like they're doing at this time right now, this is very busy, very crowded time. So these travelers would come, and they would, instead of bringing sacrifices with them, they would, they would bring money and then they would go to the temple and they say, you know, rather than try to drag a sheep or a goat or, or a dove or whatever it is that they're going to be sacrificing along with them, they would just go and buy one there. It was just easier. But they were coming from different places, so, so they, they would have to have exchange, money, their money exchanged into the, into the common currency there in Jerusalem. And so these money changers set up booths. And where did they set them up? They set them up in the Gentiles' courtyard. 
And then the guys with the animals, they, they set up booths. They said, well, this is convenient. You know, all the Jews coming in, we'll just set up booths out here. And so you have animals and you have doves and you have uh, all this stuff going on. You've got money changes in there. They're haggling around and all this. And right next to them are the Gentiles who are trying to worship. And Jesus walks in and he's angry. He, he's angry that they had to worship in the middle of the circus. See, the, Jesus cleansing the temple was not just about, hey, they're buying and selling in, in church. They're buying and selling in the temple. This was about people not being able to worship. You see, Jesus cares about the nations. Jesus cares about the nations. Which one? All of them. Not just the United States. Not just Israel. He cares about all the nations. We call that missions. So we call we have a missions team. And to be a part of the missions team, you just have to say, I want to be a part of the missions team. <laughs> it's, it's that easy, right? So what do we call it missions? If you're, if you're new to church, that's kind of a church word that we don't really talk about. We call it missions because the last thing Jesus did, we're going to close out and look at some of these things, but that Jesus gave us a mission to accomplish when he left. And the mission was to go to all the nations and tell them about Jesus, right? So, so we call it missions, the missions team, because we want to be a part of Jesus' mission that he gave us to reach our world for Christ. So let's, when you think about missions, what do you typically think about? We typically think about the Great Commission, right? If you've been around church much, the Great Commission. What, what is the what is Great Commission? We think about things like John 3.16. For God so loved who? The world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God didn't just love Israel. It says God loved the world, right? Mark 16.15 talks about this, this commission. It says, And Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. Right? So, so when we think about missions, we think, Oh, well, that's something in the New Testament where Jesus told us to go out and do this. No, it's, it's, it's way bigger than that. In fact, it's way more than a New Testament concept. God has been concerned about reaching the entire world, reaching all the nations from Genesis chapter 3, from the very beginning. Adam and Eve fall in the Garden of Eden, and, and as a result of that, uh, Genesis 3.15 says this. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's, geez, God's talking to Satan who, who convinced Eve and Adam to sin. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bru bruise his heel. That's a little confusing. Let me just explain. What he's saying is, Adam, Eve, you have fallen. You have fallen, and you are separated from me. And there are consequences to that. But I'm going to send somebody through Eve, through her seed, through her posterity. I'm going to send somebody who will make things right. And that was who the Jews called the Messiah. And that was, of course, Jesus. You see, when you read the Old Testament, you, 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 might, you might feel a little bit left out. When we read the Old Testament, we might feel a little left out because it seems like it's all about Israel. Right? Don't you read the Old Testament and think, okay, I can't wait get, to get to the New Testament because that's where it talks about me. That's where it talks about the church. All this stuff in the Old Testament, it's all about Israel. And have you ever just, have you ever just been at that place and man, it doesn't seem fair really that God chose one nation and, and they're like God's favorite? It may seem a little unfair on the surface. Why did God set Israel apart and make it the theme of the Old Testament? Well, Abraham is chosen because of his faith to be the conduit by whom, through whom the Messiah is going to come. God looks at Abraham and he says, okay, the Messiah is coming. I'm going to pick a nation. I'm going to start a nation. We're going to do this through Abraham. And it's through this nation that my son will come. Through Abraham, going all the way back and going through. So God promises that he's going to make Abraham the father of a great nation. 
in, in, this, in, this, in following the story of history, what we don't really realize is it, it's, it's, it's the whole Bible is just the story of Jesus. It, it's, it's about from Genesis 3.15, we need Jesus, to I'm going to have a nation that Jesus is going to come through, and then to Jesus coming. The whole Bible is, is about Jesus. It's, it's the story of the whole Bible. And so what's happening is God chooses Israel for a specific purpose. Th their, their purpose was to be a missionary nation. Their purpose was to be a light to the rest of the world that would reflect God so they would see who God was and be reminded of all that he is. Let, let's look at that. Genesis chapter 12, God speaks to Abraham. He says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, right? I will bless you, and your name will be great, and you shall be a blessing. So he was blessed in order to what? Be a blessing. Let's read the rest. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you, what? All the families of the earth shall be blessed. What's he saying? He's saying that I'm going to use you. I'm going to use this nation, the nation of Israel, to be a light to the entire world, to point them to me. They were chosen to be used by God. Were they special to God? Yes. What made them special? Because God used them. Well, what makes us special? I mean, if God uses us, that's about as special as it gets. You see, Israel was blessed to be a blessing. It was way bigger than just Israel. But somewhere along the line, they forgot that. Let's read Psalm 67. It's kind of interesting to look at some passages in the Old Testament that, that talk about this. Psalm 67 Verse 1 is a popular song that's actually on the radio right now. It's a great song, and I'm not, I'm not running the song down. I love the song. But it says, this may sound familiar if you've ever listened to 104.3 or 93.3 or 90.1. It's a great song. But it says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. Lord, bless us and keep us, you know, and whatever. I can't, I'm not saying it right, but, you know, however it goes. <laughs> I won't do that to you again. Um, but however it goes, right, and make his face shine upon us. And that's, and, the, and we love that because that's the blessing, right? But what's the rest of the verse say? It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us, make his face shine upon us. Why? So that your ways may be known on earth. Your salvation among what? All nations. May the peoples praise you. God, may all the peoples praise you. Why was God blessing Israel? God, God was blessing Israel so that all of God's ways would be made known to the earth. That the people would look and see what God was doing in this nation. And they would say, I want to be a part of that. Verse 4 says, may the nations be glad. And sing for joy. See, it's, it's, it's not about Israel. It's about the, all of the nations. But Israel gets to be chosen to be used to reach the nations. It says, may the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still. Why? Why does he ask for God to bless? So all the ends of the earth will fear him. God uses Israel to be a blessing to bring the nations to him. Psalm 46.10. We've, we did this before when we did cat dog theology. We, we all know the verse, ready? Be still and finish the verse. Be still and what? Be still and know that I am God. And we stop. What does the rest of it say? Verse 10, he says, be still and I'm God, I will be what? Exalted among the nations, right? I will be exalted in the earth. Exodus chapter 19, God actually tells Israel 
that they are to be priests, a nation of priests. Let's, let's read it. It says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine, right? For you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So what's he tell them? He's telling Moses, tell the Israelites that you're to be a kingdom of priests. What's a priest's job? A priest's job is to connect people to God. So, so we're reading this, we're seeing, okay, God chooses a nation. This nation's role is to be so used by God that it's to be a light that shines that all the nations see and they know that there's a God in heaven. Then he tells them, you're to be a nation of priests. Your job is to connect all of the nations to me. You see, from very beginning, from Genesis, all the way through to Revelation, where it says that somebody from every nation, tribe, and tongue will be standing before the throne of God. It's about everybody having an opportunity to hear the gospel. You see, God chose to bless Israel so they would be an example to all the nations of who he is. You ever wonder why he got so angry when Israel messed up? You know, when you read the Old Testament, you see this whole cycle. Israel gets it right, they get it wrong, God judges them, he gets mad at them. Why does he get mad at them? Why, what, is, what is typically the cause for him getting mad at them? They become like the other nations. They begin to do the things the other nations do. But God had set Israel apart to be separate. God had set Israel apart to be different. If Israel was allowed to become like all the other nations, there would be no nation on earth to remind our world who God is. Do you, do you see that? He, he's, he's so angry with them when they became just like the nations around them. It was all about reaching the nations. From the very beginning, it was about everybody. We read the Old Testament and think, oh, this is just about Israel. No, it's about Israel being a light so we can all hear about God. And that's exciting. That's why we're called to not be like the world too. That's why you and I should look different than the people, people in our world who do not know Christ. If, we, if, we, if there's no difference, what is there that draws them and points them to God? We're to, we're to act different. We're to love harder. <laughs> you know, we're to serve. We're to, we're to point people to Christ by being different. So in the Old Testament, that was the whole role, right? And then you come to the New Testament. And what happens is, somewhere along the way, the Jews forgot their purpose. Somewhere along the way, Israel lost their purpose. Instead of being this nation that was supposed to be a priest to the other nations, instead of being this nation that was supposed to be a light where that would be a conduit to, 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 to God, they became exclusive. You're a Jew, and if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And if the shadow of a Gentile falls on you, go home and take a shower. You know, I mean, that's unclean, that's terrible. And one of the reasons why the religious leaders got so upset with Jesus is because Jesus did things that nobody else has done. And he's talking to people who aren't Jews. And he's loving them. Does he love Israel? Yes, because he chose them to be the nation through which his message would spread. But it doesn't mean that he loved, didn't love the other nations. They lost sight of the fact that they were to be blessed to be a blessing. If we're not careful, we can forget that our purpose is to reach others for Jesus also. We have to be very careful that our Christianity doesn't become more about ourselves than about others. So, jump back into our story. Jesus comes on the scene, and they've completely lost sight of their whole purpose. To tell everybody, to give everybody an opportunity to worship God. And he gets mad. It violates his character. 
he comes at the beginning of his ministry, and he doesn't just talk to Jews. He passes through Samaria on purpose to talk to a Samaritan woman. The disciples come back, what in the world are you doing, Jesus? Do you understand this, this lady is not a Jew? And Jesus is like, yeah, I get it, <laughs> right? He casts out demons. He feeds multitudes who are Gentiles. He heals people who are Gentiles. And each time he does it, the religious leaders get more and more furious. They lost their purpose. Let's read it again. So they came to Jerusalem. Jesus goes in the temple, begins to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares to the temple. Then he taught. See, this is constructive anger, right? He uses this moment as a teaching moment. It says, he taught them saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? Verse 18, what's their response? The scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. And this is where they finally just said, this is it. And the crucifixion is coming in a week. You see, Jesus cares not just about the Jews. Jesus cares not just about the United States. Jesus cares more than just about Harrison, Ohio. Jesus cares about every person that's been born on this earth. And this passion that he has, he says, is a passion that we should also have. Jesus commands us to also care about the nations. In his last moments, before he is crucified and before he ascends back into heaven, right? We see that the ministry of caring for nations is passed to us. In Mark 16, 15, listen to these, listen to these conversations he has. Five different conversations. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do, do we pray for people who aren't in our neighborhood? Do, do we even see or think about the needs about people in our world? We, we live in Harrison. There's probably 20 churches here. And there are cities, large cities, who have not heard the name of Christ one time. We look at the children of Israel, we look at these religious leaders, and we think, how in the world could they lose their purpose? How could they lose their focus? But if we don't care about missions, then we are them. Luke 24, it says, Jesus said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding so they could comprehend the scriptures. It says, then he said to them, thus is it written, and thus it is necessary, it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Why? And that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached to his name, preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. So they start where they are and they go out to all nations. Look at this third time. He says in John 19, the same day at the same evening, being the first day of the week. Uh, when the doors were, were shut and the, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, this is after, his, after the resurrection. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father sent me, so send I you. I also send you. Why did Jesus come? Jesus comes very clearly to tell us, I came so the world could know about me. I'm sending you to do the same thing. Matthew 28. This is real familiar. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. What nations? Right? All the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Teach them to observe all the things I commanded you. And Lord, I'm with you always, even at the end of the age. I'll be with you as you accomplish this mission. Right? Acts 1.8, fifth time. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and what? To the ends of the earth. After this, he said he was, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. What were Jesus' very last words before he left? Go to the ends of the earth to tell everybody about me. Right? So this week, we're starting our missions team. Timing could not be better. We have to be careful that we don't become like Israel and, and, and begin to just focus just on ourselves. We, we, we're very blessed where we live. What if you were born in Afghanistan? What if you had been born in Mongolia? What if you had been born in Russia? What if you had been born in Africa? Does God love us more because we got to be born here in the United States? No. We are so blessed. But why have we been blessed? Like the children of Israel, why have we been blessed? We've been blessed what? To be a blessing. So that means that we are to fulfill this mission. We are to, to go. Or we are to send. We are to give money to make it possible for others to go. We are all to pray. Right? That's our purpose. Jesus was angry at the temple. Why? Because he cared about all the nations having an opportunity to worship. And then he winds up with his last thing he says before he leaves. And he says, I, I want you to care in the way I care. Our world needs Christ. One of the reasons why I, I would love for our church to just continue to grow and be a strong church is because the brighter the light shines at home, the further it's going to reach. And so we're going to support our missionaries in a new and fresh way. We're going to pray. We're going to try to fulfill God's command to, to go and send and financially give to make it possible for others to go. We do that. People give money to missions separate from their offerings, uh, and that money all goes to support missions, right? We're going to do that because God cares. And then we're going to do the same thing here right where we live. We're going to tell our world around us also that God cares. That's the story of the temple. So let's pray. Most holy God, I want to thank you so much for our time together. I want to thank you for your blessings. You've blessed us beyond measure. And God, I just pray that you would just um, challenge us to look beyond ourselves. It's so easy for us, for me, to read the Bible and, and see the things that other people <laughs> didn't figure out and didn't get right. Sometimes without recognizing that I'm that person. I just pray you'd help each of us to begin to look into and just ask that question, God, do I care about people beyond where I live? And if I do, what am I doing to make that possible for them to hear about you? Challenge us, God. I just pray, God, for our missionaries again right now. And God, I just ask that you would just encourage them and support them and bless them, Lord, as you're using them to accomplish your will and your purpose. May we be a part of that, Lord. We just love you today. In your son's name, amen. I'd like to invite you to stand. So the message is the same as it is every week. People need Jesus. People all around our world need Jesus. 
But let's make it more personal. You need Jesus. We need to come to him and recognize that this whole story of the Bible, this whole story of history is about Jesus making a way, God sending Jesus to make a way for us to have a relationship restored with him. Sins forgiven, lives changed, purpose and meaning in life. And until we do that, we're not going to understand what life is. We can't worry about out there until we get in here figured out. So if you're at that place where you say, Pastor Doug, I don't know Christ, I invite you to just, in faith, to say, I don't understand it all, but I'm going to give myself to you today. It's really, a, it's simple in the words or the, the heart behind it. But it's hard for us to let go of ourselves. We may be here and say, you know, I've been in church for a long time, but I've really not been very outward focused. I've not been doing much to share the blessings that I've been blessed with. So maybe as we're praying and the song sings, maybe you could be getting to pray and ask God, how can I be a blessing? You've done so much for me. How can I be a blessing? Just watch and see the doors God opens up. The song plays this time is for you. Holy God, we're just here, here to be used. Israel was special because you chose to use them. God, I can think of no greater privilege or honor than to just be tapped on the shoulder by you to be used. God, may we each begin to look for opportunities. to go out into our world and to be a light in a very dark place. Open our eyes and we can see beyond our city and our country and see the world. Thank you for your love for the world. 
because had it not been for that, where would we be? We just love you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. I'm going to plug it one more time. If you would like to be a part of the missions team, how's that? Talk about missions all morning and then invite you to be part of the missions team. Super easy. Text 97000, put weekly update in, and you will immediately get a link with today's updates, with this week's update. And um, as you click on that, just click to join now, and you'll be subscribed to our missions team. It's going to be a work in progress as we get it up and going, but I'm super excited about this, to say the least. I guess something else I'd like to do. Um, I don't know if my mom's still watching or not. Being a pastor does have some perks. <laughs> and uh, um, my mom is in ICU right now, and she's, I think, is watching right now. And um, she is just not doing very well. And uh, if we could just have just a quick prayer for her, uh, I'm sure that would mean a lot. Let's pray. Most holy God, we thank you so much. Uh, for your love for us. Just lift up uh, my mom, uh, Lucille, as everybody knows her. God, I thank you for just the light that she has been to so many people. I think about every kid that grew up in our church for years learning about Jesus from her. And I, I just I just pray, God, that right now that you would just bless her, strengthen her, Lord, Give her peace and uh, just give the doctors wisdom, Lord, as, as they are trying to help her to feel better. We just love you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to be dismissed with a song.